Psalm 23 part 2 Now this morning we are going to continue our teachings that we started yesterday on Psalm 23 Now just want to remind you of what we saw yesterday we saw that this Psalm 23 was a psalm that David wrote sang but it was not something that he did on his own he was inspired to do it and he did it in the context of not a shepherd writing about sheep but rather as a sheep looking and making his or her boast in its shepherd and i told you that there are three things that qualifies jehovah and jesus to stand in the office of shepherd number 1 his ownership on us is legitimate because he is the one who brought us into this world he is the one who understands us thoroughly in fact if you are alive today it's because he has us alive to be a peculiar object of his own affection then the second thing i told you was this even though men rejected him starting way back in the garden of eden he took the initiative to come and seek us out whether it is in the garden of eden as jehovah or 2000 odd years ago as jesus you find that the initiative was a divine initiative to start off with and finally i told you he cares for us continually now that's where we stopped from we went to the book of revelation uh, sorry hebrews chapter 7 and we read from verse 25 therefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that cometh unto god by him seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them now we need someone to pray for us the bible tells us there is one who prays for us continually now i may pray for you for some time and then stop because i am a human being i have limitations but the one in heaven prays continually for you he intercedes continually for you day or night now that gives us a complete assurance in our hearts that the one that we are talking about qualifies hands down to be my shepherd he is not a hireling now who is a hireling a hireling is a man who is taken on hire if he is paid wages he'll be around if his wages are not paid he'll take off someone pays him a better salary he is going to move he has no concern for the sheep but look at jesus the bible says he ever liveth to make intercession for you highlight that word please he ever liveth that means if you were to ask jesus jesus what's the reason for your living to make intercession for you to pray for you to speak for you with whom with the father so that everything the father has purpose will come to pass in your life if you are worried about failure stop it right now never be concerned about failure you cannot fail you look at me and ask me why can't i fail well because god cannot fail he does not know what failure is all about god cannot fail jesus does not know what failure is and if they are looking after you like the bible says they are then you will not fail don't look at temporary setbacks and think they are failure failures are not temporary setbacks you look at a man who's never tried even once that man is a failure not a man who tries and fails hallelujah not a man who tries and fails a man who tries and fails just has a temporary setback that setback will change there are there are ways and means that the bible tells us we can turn that you know situation around you can do it by prayer you can do it by the confession of god's word you can do it by tithing you can do it by giving you can turn any situation around any temporary setback can be turned around but a man who refuses to try even once he is a failure 
is an utter failure because he has never believed the God whom he serves. Now, we're going to move on in our teachings this morning. We're going to look a little bit about sheep. Because if you understand sheep a little bit, you'll understand a lot about yourself. Sheep do not just take care of themselves. They require endless attention. In fact, they require meticulous care. And the care that is shown for sheep far exceeds anything else that is shown to any livestock. Now the behavior of sheep and human beings are similar in many ways. If you're writing down, please take it. Number one, mob instincts. You ever heard of the jackal who started howling even though he fell into a you know, tub of indigo and was considered a big person in the jungle. When all the other jackals started howling, this jackal also started howling. Now look at sheep. If you drive long distance, you'll know what I'm talking about. When you see groups of them, you know, crossing the road. One will just cross. Immediately, the others will just pile on. Totally oblivious of danger. That's why don't go with the crowds. Totally oblivious of danger. Totally oblivious of what is happening right there and then on the road. They'll just cross the road. Look at how human beings operate. The closest we have of this is during riot situations. One football fan will kick another football fan and after that is mayhem. Nobody knows who started it. Some won't even know who they're kicking. <laughs> because half of them would have removed their t-shirts earlier. Some of them will be kicking their own men. But mob instincts. That's why the Bible likens us to sheep. Amen. Can I have Amen, please? Don't get mad with me. This is what the Bible says. And after I started preparing for these teachings, I'm seeing it far more than I saw earlier. <laughs> Nearly every page of the Bible where I turn to, there's something that relates to sheep there in the scriptures. So number one, mob instincts. Number two, fears. Sheep are fearful creatures. Some time ago, I visited the animal husbandry unit of the Madras Veterinary College and there was a doctor there who took us around. Me and another friend of mine, we were there and you know we were just going around and he was showing us so many things. Then he showed us the slaughtering place. I never seen it in my life. It was such a huge affair. Fully in stainless steel, like two doors coming together and clamping up. I was wondering what the you know whole idea was all about because I've been to the other places where there's where the government has its own slaughtering houses. Those places are terrible places. So I'm wondering what, what this big deal of noise was all about. Then this doctor started explaining to me. He said, We also sell this meat. So I asked him. I know you sell this meat, but why all this big, you know, paraphernalia before a creature is killed? What's all this about? Then he said, I'll show you. He went and brought a, a cylindrical, you know, stainless steel unit. He said, this is the gun. We let the sheep come in and then we clamp it up. And in one swift motion, we pierce the skull and the sheep die. The reason we do it is this. Sheep is one of the only creatures who when they are terrified can make their blood congeal. And that will spoil the meat. So when the creature is killed, we want all the blood to flow out. We want everything out. So when the sheep is let into this, this place, it doesn't know why it's entering there. It doesn't see the familiar, you know, Things that will frighten it. It's just brought in, made to stand there. These, you know, steel doors will come together, clamp up, and then we do it in one motion. Now, one of the major things you will find every human being has to deal with is the area of fear. 
That's why the Bible tells us the moment we are born again, God hands, handles it. Why? Look at when fear entered. In the Garden of Eden, in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, the first word Adam speaks to God, till then he has never spoken fear. Even when the lion came and stood before Adam, he just named the lion. He never ran away from the lion. It meant nothing to Adam. It was just one of the creatures of you know, the garden or in the garden. But the moment sin entered Adam's heart, the nature of the devil entered into him. He died to God. The first statement he made was this. I heard your voice, Jehovah, and I was afraid. Amen. Genesis chapter 3. Okay, just let's just see it first. Because there are people who have never read that place of scripture. So just bear with me. Genesis chapter 3, verse 10. Please write these scriptures down if you didn't know them. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid. Fear. Because I was naked. That means I felt I was vulnerable. I felt that something had left me. I felt that I was exposed now to attack. That's what he was saying. There's much more than just, you know, a statement like the people of the world want us to understand. He's talking about his nakedness. It goes beyond that. This man felt now he was vulnerable to the attack of something unknown. He didn't know what it was. Whether it would be nature, whether it would be a demonic spirit, whether it would be sickness, disease, he had never known it, but he knew down in his heart something that protected me had left. Fierce. So when a man is born again, the first thing God tells a man is, God's not given you the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind. Hallelujah. Power, love, and of a sound mind. Now when you talk about the fear of God, it is not a fear that will make you run away from God. It's a fear that will run, make you run towards God. The wrong kind of fear that Adam experienced made him run away from God and hide. But the fear of God that we have brings us together in worship. Number three. Now these are just examples. Timidity. Sheep are very timid creatures. By themselves they are not bold. They need company. They need a lot of company. Are you coming to church? Then I'll be in church. I'll show up. Not coming? Oh my, you know, I also needed the rest. My leg was paining. <laughs> Timidity has to be overcome as a Christian believer. That's why when the sheep is making its boast in the shepherd, these are areas in which the sheep knows it is vulnerable. But in making its boast, begins to overcome. Number four, stubbornness. Sheep are quite stubborn. They're stubborn especially when they do wrong. These teachings are going to be exciting, believe me. It may be a little bit uncomfortable for us, but we'll all grow. Hallelujah. So we, you understand stubbornness very well. I don't have to go into it. The next thing is, sheep are stupid creatures. They can be stubborn, they can be doing wrong, but they don't have it in them to make an independent decision. I'm in the wrong place, at the wrong time, doing the wrong stuff. Let me go back to the shepherd. That's why sheep need a shepherd. Now you know why God places pastors. The phone rings. Don't get mad with me if you didn't show up in church. <laughs> it's my duty to ask you. It's my work to seek you out. Why don't you come? I'll come tomorrow. That's the general thing. I know you'll come tomorrow, but why didn't you come today? That's the question. You see, these instincts are things that we need to be dealing with because these are things that either make us or break us. If they're not dealt with, they'll finish us up. As you will, you know, get to know a little later. But if we deal with them in the right way, the way the shepherd wants us to deal with it, we will see that instead of it breaking us, it makes us. And finally, sheep have perverse habits, bad habits. What those bad habits are, we'll see later. But just write it down. 
Now, regardless of all these flaws in sheep, Jehovah and Jesus still want to be our shepherd. That's the best thing. They delight in making us their own and caring for us daily. In fact, Psalm 23 may be called David's hymn of praise to divine diligence. Because like I told you a little earlier, sheep require meticulous care and attention. They are not ordinary creatures. And if you read the entire psalm, it recounts the manner in which the good shepherd spares no pains for the welfare of his sheep. There's nothing too much for the shepherd to do. He will do it. In fact, one of the very first things that shepherds do when they get sheep is that they establish a unique relationship with the sheep. That's what we sang about a little earlier. What do they do? They first, first mark their sheep. Now, how do shepherds mark their sheep? The mark is a very distinctive mark that the shepherd places on the sheep to differentiate the sheep that belongs to their flock and what belongs to someone else. That means from a distance, because we are not talking about just having six or seven sheep walking with a shepherd, regardless of what the number is, the shepherd, when he meets other shepherds and let the sheep mingle together, must be able to distinguish from a group of over a thousand who belongs to him. I think I can, to a certain extent, with the people of this church. <laughs> Hallelujah. When others say sickness, they'll be saying, bind the devil. Bind the devil! When others say poverty, they'll say, no, we're standing up against that spirit. That's an unclean spirit. Because constantly the mark that is placed by the shepherd is a distinctive mark. But now we're looking at it in the context of Jesus. Now, how do shepherds first mark? Let's look at that. They normally take sheep belonging to their flock and use what is called a killing knife. It's a very, very sharp knife. And they use this knife to place a distinctive mark on either one year or two years of the sheep. On both years of the sheep. In fact, they cut the year by placing the year on a wooden block and notching the year with that killing knife to make their own distinctive mark. Some will have three jagged edges. Some will have two. Some will have the year split itself. No matter what the mark is, the shepherd knows it's his sheep. Listen carefully. Some of us will immediately start groaning in our hearts. Before you groan, please listen. This marking ceremony is painful, not only for the sheep, but also for the shepherd. Because knowing fully well the makeup of the sheep, he still chooses to place the mark on the sheep. It's painful for him. But in the midst of the pain that goes on, it's a mutual pain. Pain on behalf of the shepherd because he is marking his sheep. Pain on behalf of the sheep that is receiving the mark. What happens? A lifelong bond is formed between the two. Amen. It's a lifelong bond and a lifelong mark of ownership which can never be erased there is a parallel to this found in scripture that we are going to be studying I want you to come with me to Exodus chapter 21 Exodus chapter 21 please and verses 1 to 6 this is the scripture portion which deals with how you deal with a slave or a servant who refuses to go out of your house for, for the sole reason that after staying with you for so long he just wants to continue to stay with you now this was, this was peculiarly given to Israel by God as a form of divine methodology that could be adopted to keep away abuse now let's look at Exodus chapter 21 and we're going to read verses 1 to 6 now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. 
if thou buy a hebrew servant six years he shall serve and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing follow very carefully we're going to be seeing it slowly when you buy a servant and he is a hebrew this is applied to only israelites to keep abuse away from israel israelites were instructed to let that hebrew servant go free in the seventh year he didn't have to pay anything if he came in by himself he shall go out by himself if he were married then his wife shall go out with him so you can Im imagine the importance god lays for marriage now this is a bought slave okay don't forget it's not the today's servant who will bang the refrigerator when you tell her don't touch this don't touch that <laughs> and walk out of the house this is not talking about today's servant <laughs> today's servants have so many privileges which the bible servants and slaves are in in those days lacked they were just considered commodities follow please if he came in by himself he shall go out by himself but if he came married then his wife shall go out with him if his master have given him a wife and she have borne him sons or daughters the wife and her children shall be her masters and he shall go out by himself now listen very carefully this is not talking about the master taking the the other man's wife and the children and just sending this man out no this is talking about continuous employment opportunities if that man was legally you know declared free on the seventh year but his wife had come into a relationship with him only for the last three years as a wife then she still had another four years to go four years in which she would be looked after while that man could go and employ himself somewhere else hallelujah thank god god is a god of great concern not a god of abuse not a god of abuse i'll tell you why look at verse 5 and if the servant shall plainly say highlight that verse you ask me why pastor why what's this highlight remember at one time by the time you're through almost all parts of your bible will be highlighted you'll have to get yourself another one the servant had to say the owner could not assume everything you receive in life you say it you will get it if you say something else you will get only what you said if the servant came and said plainly what i love my master that means this was a love relationship not i fear my master that's what one servant did with the one talent i fear you so i went and hid the one talent he said you wicked servant amen you wicked servant because whatsoever is not a faith is sin if it is not a faith it is sin even when you serve the lord i think maybe two or three months ago i wrote about it there are different forms of people who come into a church service like this with different ideas if i don't go something will happen to me please listen you coming to worship god is based on a love relationship not a fear relationship not a fear relationship you love him why because you continually know you are dead without him but now you live not exist not exist you're not pleasing me by coming here you're not you're not even coming to see me you're coming here because you love him he's the dominant factor in your life now look at this servant the servant had to go and say i love my master remember one of the many meanings of shepherd is master i love my master my wife and my children i will not go out free see the order of importance who comes first please keep me master why should i because i love my wife i love my children i'm living for them only please keep me go seventh year take off 
But if the man came and said, I love you. You, sir, you've been fair with me. You've always been good. You've been my you know, greatest source of inspiration. And it also happens that I love my wife and the children. Follow. Then, circle the word then. Whenever you see the word then, always ask the question when. So number one, who comes in your life? A good shepherd. It's only after that, everyone else. So first love. Write it there, first love. First love, again I'm telling you, is not a Pentecostal cliche. Jesus is my first love. But everything else is not looking like first love. He is not. <laughs> Don't play games. Don't think you can fool God. You can't fool God. He may know you are stupid. But stupidity is dealt with in God's kingdom. That's the... I mean, you will you'll hear and you will learn fast enough. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost. That means legally he must bring him to the judges and say this man wants to stay with me. Then he brings him to the door or unto the doorpost. Why? Because we have already seen in our teachings on the precious blood of Jesus that the doorpost was the place where the blood was applied. It was the place of sacrifice. Just write it down if you never heard it. Just write it down. Today, people who don't know Jesus, but who serve unclean spirits, dedicate their doorposts to demons. That's why you'll see a lot of yellow lines running here, running there. They don't know it, but they're just doing it. Because the devil knows how important the doorway into your house is. You got to guard the doorway of your house. Never let an unclean person enter your house. You know somebody is unclean, just keep the man out. Keep the lady out. Keep that person out. I'm not talking of just unbelievers. Unbelievers can come in and go. There are people who you know are pure wicked. Don't let them in. Because when they come in, they come in with demonic influences. You see it. You'll be talking to a man. Suddenly the you start getting a headache. You don't even know why you're getting a headache. You're fine. Nothing wrong. It's just that influence, that place. Sometimes you go into a place. It's not the incense sticks or the jaw stick. It's just that atmosphere. The whole place is permeated with evil. Be very careful. Someone continually speaks negative things, unclean things. He's all the time wanting to enter your house and talk to you about this sickness, that sickness, this failure, that failure. Don't let the man into your house. Don't let him in. You can let others in. And if you don't know, ask God. God will show you who to let in and who to keep out. Can I have Amen, please? I don't let unclean people into my house. I have nothing to do with them. When a person is unclean, please listen. When a person is unclean, keep the person out. Why? Because the doorway is sacred. Now this man, the master had to bring the servant to this place. Remember what I told you a little earlier. How sheep's ears are notched. It's put on a wooden block. He takes the ear lobe and he bows the ear through with an awl. And after that is done, that means he makes a hole in the ear. He shall serve him forever. Lifetime. He serves this man. Because blood has been marked on that doorway. It's his passport inside and outside the house always. He is not a servant any longer. He is more a household member. I am rejoicing this morning. Oh, I am just so... Glad to be here listening to God. I'm listening to God myself. No more does he have to ask permission to come in. He's not a temporary servant for seven years. Now he belongs to the household for life. He shall serve forever. Come with me to Deuteronomy chapter 15, please. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 12 to 17. And if thy brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee and serve thee six years, 
then in the seventh year thou shalt let him go free from thee now look at this verse 13 i told you why god's not a god of abuse when thou sendest him out free from thee thou shall not let him go away empty a few amens doesn't much go with our grain of thinking why should i he's not working for me any longer after all somebody else is going to use him why should i give him anything listen you want to be how you want to be christ like <laughs> christ like then you better listen to what god's word says and do it look at deuteronomy 15 please thou shall not let him go away empty but thou shall furnish him liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor and out of thy wine press of that wherewith the lord thy god had blessed thee thou shall give unto him follow let's let's just read liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor that means grain also and out of thy wine press why because wine is symbolic of joy give him joyfully what he wants why because you in turn were blessed by god and to keep the blessing going you give amen if you withhold the blessing stops that's why i'm talking about growth this morning don't sit and envy a man who's having in plenty if you check the man's life he'll be a giver be a giver you withhold finished you stop the blessing yourself now let's read verse 15 and thou shall remember that thou was a bondman in the land of egypt circle the word remember that means in your giving you remember your former condition you yourself were a slave people were misusing you how do i relate to it today pastor well you were a slave to the devil he was taking you for a big chucker he was taking you for a big ride you were working and working and working and he was taking your money hospital bills medical bills unnecessary expenditures he is taking everything from you and you're toiling and toiling and toiling never had one holiday in your life never bought one thing that you desired to buy because every time you got the money you got the bonus you got something immediate expenditure god brought you out of the land of egypt amen out of sin teaching you the word now let's read it remember that therefore i command thee this thing today that's the reason why does god tell us to give because at one time we could not give how many of you were there i was there you were born givers liars don't lie none of us are born givers all of us have a nature to hold back keep back not give don't give why should i give must i give some will wait six weeks in prayer to find out where must i give the shirt to that person god spoke to you to give a shirt just give it sir forget about asking and re-asking and re-asking by the time you will get confused you won't know what to do with the shirt you'll wear the shirt i've seen people do foolish people never learn to trust god never learn to cross that barrier to make the transition to be christ-like none of us were like that that's why we needed a savior that's why i said if you're saying i was born a giver you're not born a giver we are all born liars we had to come out of it we needed a savior we needed somebody to come and to get us out of bondage to teach us how to be dynamic givers to show himself to us and say be like me he didn't say be like michael he didn't say be like gabriel he said be like me i am holy be holy also let's lift up holy hands and give thanks to god i'm preaching this morning don't get offended this is not the time to be offended i'm included in that if i'm saying you're a liar i'm a liar also i was born that way none of us like to give but giving stems from a relationship with god because he is giver and he tells us if ever you're having a doubt about giving remember where i picked you from you were a slave yourself you didn't like it now let's read please we're going to read this verse 17 or 16 
and it shall be if he say unto you that is the clause the clause for a lifelong relationship comes from the part of the slave if he says how did he get saved jesus come into my life follow carefully romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 tells us how a man is saved a man is saved not because you left cigarette not because you left drinking not because you left gambling those left after you got saved you were not saved because of that you were saved because according to romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 you believed in your heart the lord jesus christ and you confessed his lordship over your life that's it you spoke your way into the kingdom now you speak your way into the treasury house also you spoke your way into the kingdom you believed in your heart and confessed with your mouth if you read romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 highlight the word confess not i left cigarette smoking not i left this and that regardless of what you left you were not saved because of that you were saved because of your faith in jesus christ and the confession of your faith that's why never come and try to win the approval of god by saying i did this lord i did that lord he is not bothered he is not impressed he is not impressed Lord, you know I read ten chapters. So what? If you are going to come for works and try to win approval, believe me, God will ask you why didn't you read the eleventh one? Because you are trying to win approval from Him, and God can never give approval on works. But if it is faith plus works, God will approve. Because your works is based on the faith you have. Now look at verse sixteen. If He say unto you, what? I will his will is involved in it I will not go away from thee because he loveth thee and thine house because he is well with thee he sees it's the best place to be which is the best place to be today people will tell you it's not silver sands today 100% people tell you not golden beach best place to be is in the house of god forever some will have to learn it the hard way but some can learn it like you and i are learning it this morning when the spirit of god speaks hallelujah that's not the best place to be today you invite somebody come let's go to the seashore they'll say no if you if you want you go if you want you go sir i'm not coming you go have a wonderful time you may even discover something but i'm not coming i'm just not coming that side Then every now and then the sea is throwing up some dead body. Nobody wants to go there. That means that's not the best place to go. But if you come to the house of God, where God abides, the Mount Zion of God, the place where the Word of God goes forth, you can always know beyond a shadow of doubt that's the best place to be. That's the best place to be. Now some of you will know why. Some time ago I was narrating the incident of how. my brother in law and i found ourselves in a place which we never knew was an arak shop when the storm hit wizak we both were on the road we wanted shelter we ran into this place and i just took one look across my shoulder i found these people in total oblivion of what's happening outside i looked at him he's witness to that i said let's get get out of this place because if god's wrath strikes this is the first place that will go <laughs> we shouldn't be in the wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong stuff let we were far safer outside on the road driving back home than inside this place immediately we took off it's amazing that the bike never conked out i never seen water like that running on the streets of isaac like it was in that on that particular day it was rising and it's only when we got home we heard that it was some kind of a storm that had struck the place we never knew it is not some rain follow carefully because he loveth you and your house and it's well with him there then verse 17 thou shall take an all and thrust it through his ear unto the door and he shall be thy servant forever and also unto thy maid servant thou shall do likewise 
Now we'll just stop with that. Whether it's a male servant or a maid servant, the boring of the year declared whose they were for life. Now I'm going to show you a parallel. A parallel that we have read earlier, studied earlier, but never looked at it in the context of what we are seeing this morning. In Psalm 40, verse 6, there's an unusual verse. It's a prophetic psalm. Just write it down. Psalm 40, verse I mean, the whole psalm is a prophetic psalm. And in verse 6, there is a statement of what would happen when the Messiah would come. When Jesus would come. The Bible says, My ears has thou digged that all that I hear is your voice. My ears has thou opened. Later, you'll find the writer of the book of Hebrews quoting it. If I'm not mistaken, in Hebrews chapter 10. He says, a body hast thou prepared for me. Behold, I come in the volume of thy book. It is written of me to do your will, O Lord. A body hast thou prepared for me. He's quoting from Psalm 40. But in Psalm 40 verse 6, the phrase used there is, you have digged my ear. The word, you have opened my ear, literally means in Hebrew, you have digged my ear. Digged my ear is... A reference and an inference to this what we have read in Deuteronomy look at what Jesus said I'm going to talk to you about Jesus every statement in the Gospels that Jesus made he reinforced it by saying it's not my own words what I hear the father say I say what did he tell about the Holy Ghost in John's Gospel 14 15 16 17 he said when the Holy Ghost has come he will not talk his own words what he hears, he will speak. Amen. But he will also do one thing. He will testify of me. That means he will give witness about me. You look at a man who is born again. The work of being born again is the work of the Holy Spirit. But the first word that that person says, thank you Jesus. He will testify of me. And then what else will he do? He'll take the things of mine and show it to you so it will be so simple you'll understand. My sayings, he'll make it simple for you to understand. That's what the Holy Ghost does. That's what he's doing this morning. He's here. I'm mean, grateful he's here. He's here. Don't think I'm talking from my mind. Not that smart. He's here. He's giving revelation. He's giving us understanding. That's why the Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. So get wisdom and with all you're getting, get understanding. Get understanding. Now, Jesus was marked by God in a similar fashion. When he came into this world, he came, lived on this world as God, man. Okay? But the ultimate form of love was not expressed when he healed but when he died on the cross amen when those nails bore into his body on the cross it was like the all being bowed into the air blood was shed that became the doorway for you and me to enter into that's why he sang about the cross today the mark of the cross is on every believer I'm not talking of jewelry, some cross hanging on your neck. Not talking about that. I'm talking about the mark of the cross on every believer. Every believer is marked with the cross. Marked with the blood. How? Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, verses 24-25. If any man wants to follow Jesus, what he needs to do is mark there. Then said Jesus unto his who? Disciples. If any man, includes you and me, will come after me, that means willingly, you want to come after him, or go after him, let him deny himself, okay, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it the indelible image of the cross is on every Christian disciple 
When you say I belong to Jesus and persecution rises up for that. When people laugh at you, mock you, it's the reproach of the cross you gladly bear. Everybody will understand Jesus as healer, believe me. But very, very few can understand Jesus on the cross. Unless it comes by revelation. You see, good people, they'll understand Jesus as healer. They'll say a lot of people are healing. Even today there are people, see Dr. So-and-so, she's a healer. She's bringing healing by, you know, putting prosthesis on people who are maimed and hurt. They relate healing somehow. But when it comes to the cross, a different story altogether. Thank God we are saved through the blood. Thank God we are marked for life as His. That's why we willingly follow Him. We are not reluctant followers. Willingly we follow Him. How do we do it every day? Daily by taking up our cross and following Him. What is taking up our cross? It's written there. Denying yourself. You either belong to Him or you don't belong to Him. If you're doing your own stuff, after you're saved, that means you're not gladly taking the cross any longer. You're just going ahead and living like, like the way you lived earlier. You're following your mind, you're following your flesh. The cross and its reproach you're not gladly bearing. You have not yet learned to deny yourself. I just want to say something in this place. Denying yourself is not the same thing like people today understand. One particular phrase that they use often but related to giving up things, self-denial. In most denominational churches, when it comes close to Good Friday, they'll keep out special envelopes. And these special envelopes will have one phrase printed on them, self-denial envelopes. That means if you leave eating fish, you can put the money into that cover and put it in the church. If fish eating was bad for you, what's the church doing with your money is the question. If fish eating was bad, God saying deny it. What's the church doing with your money? Listen very carefully. Men are joking. It's a terrible thing and people don't understand this. They just go and follow it. You will never read of self-denial offerings. You will read of thank offerings, first fruit offerings, the tithe, free will offerings, wave offerings, so many offerings. Never self-denial offerings. Never. The self-denial that today people are talking about is not what Jesus was saying. Denying, look at that word, deny himself. That means your high priority in life is Jesus. Hallelujah. Why are you alive? Jesus, for him. Don't lie, tell me the truth. No sir, that's it. I'm alive because of him only. Come on, please tell me what's your agenda. I have only one agenda, his will for my life. Some people will come up to you and tell me, Please, you tell me slowly. I won't tell anybody. I'll keep a secret. That's the worst, biggest lie. <laughs> I'll keep a secret. You please tell me what you want to do in life. I have only one agenda, to live for him. In the process, I may make mistakes. It doesn't matter. But I, I'm at least trying. I want to live for him. I want to serve him. That's a high priority in my life. It's, it's my agenda because it's his agenda. Deny himself. That's the phrase. Not the self-denial that people are today making. Many people understand. I'll tell you. Some of you may have laughed. But just listen. It's not a laughing matter. We were there. We know what it was. There's no one who, you know, practiced this so very, very clearly. Like I tried to do at one time. While I was in college. My parents were not here. I was still going to a denominational church. I remember this time. <laughs> you know, my friend wanted to get a motorcycle. In those days, getting a motorcycle, you had to, you know, book for a motorcycle. Can you believe it? We went and booked for a motorcycle in Pondicherry, a Rajdut. Today, nobody would go near that bike. But you won't get it here. Because there was eight years waiting period for Vespa scooters. Some of you may not even know what, that, what I'm talking about. So, my friend said, we'll go to Pondicherry. And I said, okay, we'll go. We went there to book for the motorcycle. On the way, it so happened he had known one of his 
friends, you know, was in a place called Markana. And this man invited us for lunch. Now this is during Lent, what, what they call Lenten period. So I happily went and sat with him. And, uh, you know, he kept one of the most delicious looking <laughs> prawns in front of us. And immediately a tug went on in my mind. Must I do it or must I keep Lent? Must I do it or must I keep Lent? My friend started looking at me and said, Never mind, man, come. He's also part of the church that I was going to. Nobody's there. You better you eat. Nice. And he took one and put it in his mouth. Very tasty. All the noise, you know, sound effect also. Without the Dolby. But the sound effect was very real. You won't believe I ended up eating just curd rice that day. Because I was holding on to it with everything. So much of zealousness. And I'm not even saved. What happened was, the poor fellow went into terrible guilt after he ate. He ate well. But after that, he went into terrible guilt. The whole way he was saying, I don't know why he ate the prawns. I don't know why he ate. Maybe it was the look on my face. I don't know. I don't know whether I was holding on to zealousness that made me leave the prawns. Or to make the fellow stew, I did it. I don't know. Let him feel a little bit uncomfortable. Let me keep a straight face. I don't know. I really don't know. But please listen. The self-denial is practiced so well by people, but they fail in the major things, like their love walk with Jesus, their relationship with God. I'll tell you why. Because the moment Lent is over, they'll just take off. Either they'll run into the wine shop, or they'll just dive into the packet of cigarettes, or they just wait to put all the stuff which they have not put for the 40 days into their mouth. It's like they are just waiting. When on earth is this going to get over? That means they are not at all happy in doing it also. I remember, you know, I was walking one day in Loyola on the campus. A friend of mine who was an alumni of, you know, famous school here in Madras. They were holding a old boys meet. So they were serving, you know, dinner. So he wanted to eat invite this French teacher who had been a teacher for years together, I don't want to mention his name, but of some repute here in Chennai. So that man used to come for walks in Loyola. He was by that time an elderly man. So as an old student, he wanted to go and invite him. So I was there and he said, come, we'll go just go and see. He's having his regular walks and he's walking with his rosary in his hand, saying his prayers. So I walked up to him and he invited him. He said, yeah, yeah, I'll come. Definitely I'll be there. So he said, thank you, sir. Looking forward to having you. And we turned. All of a sudden, he called him by name. Roy, Roy, listen. Sir, what? Don't have meat. We can't eat meat, but you have fish. It's Lenten time, remember? <laughs> this is exactly his words. Don't have meat, have fish. This is Lenten time. And he's holding the rosary in his hand. That means he's so clear in his thinking about food at that time. That's why I'm taking time to talk about it this morning. The denying himself is more painful than the self-denial. There are people who will fill the self-denial envelopes and throw it. But still, because they have abundance of money, will still smoke, still drink, still do their own stuff. They'll still eat meat, they'll do whatever they want. Because they say, that's just have to do something on that during that time. They'll put something extra in the self-denial envelopes and put it. But they'll just go on doing their self. I mean, their own stuff. But denying himself is painful. It entails death. Every day you die, like Paul said. Paul said it. Every day I die. Because every day there's something telling you, just do your own stuff. Why do you want to follow this Jesus? Just go ahead. Who's here? Nobody is looking. It's a flight. You're also traveling business class. Only three people are there. And the wine is on the house. <laughs> just have one peg, nothing wrong. After all, Paul told Timothy, have a little wine for your belly's sake. I mean, the, the coats will come real fast. Hard. I remember when we were coming back from Nigeria, we were traveling together, my dad, mom and I. We were on an Ethiopian Airlines flight. The stewardess came. She was, you know, serving liquor. And as she was, one person refused food. He said, I'll have the liquor throughout the journey because it's on the house <laughs> so when they came to us we said no we don't want to drink we'll have you know a meal she looked at her supper she said it's on the house sir 
I don't know which house she was meaning, but not on my house. <laughs> not on my house. My house is the house of God. Amen. We were all saved by that time. We knew, even before that, we wouldn't have you know, received it. But I'm just saying, there's a lot of difference. There's a lot of change that takes place on the inside. Even if there were nobody around, we wouldn't have touched it. That's what denying himself is more painful. Because every day there is a struggle. Go do your own stuff. Live the way you like to live. Why should you forgive? Just hold on to the grudges. Keep it. Keep reminding yourself of this and that and this and that. And always keep the wound fresh. Never allow a scab to form and a scar to form. Never let the healing process take place. Just keep the wound open. All the time keep reminding yourself of this pain and that pain. My friends, die to that and live to God. Amen. Let the cross manifest in that area in your life. Hallelujah. This concludes Pastor Isaac's message.